All right. Thanks, Sid. Um, nice to nice to see everyone. I don't see everyone yet, but I assume I'll see more. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and today I get to talk a bit about building top performing product teams. Um, we'll go through a few different topics here. Um, and I've picked out three in particular. Uh, and I wanted to just give a couple caveats before we start. So, you know, my background, as Sid mentioned, I spent about six years at YouTube building the YouTube product teams. Before that, I was at Microsoft for a number of years. I've uh, been uh, invested in a number of companies, sit on the board of Spotify and so on. So I've seen lots of different techniques, but I optimized this uh, presentation for unique over comprehensive. Lots and lots of things about building great product teams that I'm not going to cover, but I picked three things that I think I generally hear are a little different than what you might have heard before. And the second is the presentation I'll give is not really about Coda. I am presenting in Coda, but because Coda was built to enable anyone to remake the world, you're going to see a lot of Coda examples. So uh, with those two caveats, let's jump right in. Um, I have the uh, uh, divided us into three topics, and we'll start with this one. Um, and I'll give a little bit of context on this acronym, P-S-H-E. And the, the thing I would... Uh, you know, like start with here is just a little bit of background on where this story came from. When uh, back in about 2011, 2012, Larry Page took uh, took over as CEO of Google, and amongst many other changes that he made, one of the things he did was he moved us from being a functional organization into being a business unit organization, uh, meaning that up till then, product engineering, um, sales, so on, all reported right into the CEO. So all of a sudden, we had eight divisions of Google. And in that process, there was a lot of discussion about how to maintain the, the bar and, the, and uh, calibrate levels and promotions and so on when the functional areas were all split up. So I was assigned to figure this out for product management. And we ended up having this exercise that resulted in this uh, chart that I'm showing here. And I'm going to start with the, the bottom axis and, and talk a bit about scope. So when we started this process, I got together the, the heads of product from these eight different divisions. And we ran a little exercise. We took the, the rubric we had for great product managers, and we split it up into little sheets of paper. So you know, cut it up into one sheet per level, and I cut off the, the level number and the job title. So we had you know our levels, level three, level four, level five, so on. Cut all that off and said, can you identify which level this represents? And interestingly, nobody could do it. And this was, of course, Google at the point at that point was 14, 15 years old. These had been uh, these rubrics had been full of all sorts of uh, things that had been just stuffed in over time. So, for example, it might say something like this person can manage a medium sized project and uh, interviews at least three people a week and takes great notes in meetings and always sends out the trip report. And this was all sort of pulled together. And I think that was a group product manager. And the the is interesting. It's almost laughable watching us all go through this uh, exercise. If you were to take all these sheets of paper and line them up side by side, then you could figure out okay, that level is more than that level is more than that level, almost entirely based on a set of keywords that led to scope, um, and you know, medium sized project, large sized project, so on. So the first exercise we did was we tried to align that axis. And we came up with some words. And we said, OK, how about we define small? And we say, that's managing a feature, and then managing a group of features, and then managing a sub area of a product, and then managing multiple sub areas of product, and then perhaps managing a whole product, and then managing multiple products. So we laid this out, and we're quite proud of ourselves. And then, uh, then at some point, we realized this actually isn't going to work for us. And there, there were a few reasons why it wouldn't work for us. First off, th this was incredibly uncalibrated across Google. So for example, the Google search team had only one product, Google search. The Google ads team had seemingly hundreds of products. And so you know, the search team didn't like this. It was, like it, it was much harder to get promoted in the search team. The second reason we didn't like this was it felt like an input rather than an output. So we would look at this person, and we'd say, should they get promoted or not? And we'd look at it and say, well, they managed this size project. but but we gave them that job. So how can we promote them basis of, on the basis of doing the job that we gave them? Um, so there's got to be something else. And then the third reason we didn't like this was a lot of our best performers worked on incredibly risky projects. And they would often work on things that seemed small but had the chance to get big. So we didn't really like this. We invented a new axis. So this is on the left side here, uh, P-S-H-E. It stands for Problem, Solution, How, Execution. And I'll say at the onset, I've tried for many years to come up with a better acronym that actually spells a word, and I have not been able to come up with one. So you'll have to just remember, push, 
uh, and I guarantee it'll be more memorable than it sounds. So here's how it works. Early on, product manager starts, they get handed a problem, they get handed a solution, they get handed a how. What I mean by that is a set of instructions. You should meet with this person, you should write this document, uh, you should uh, uh, set up this, this uh, process, and then your job is just to execute and just do that process over and over again. At some point, the, the product manager gets a little bit more senior and they get handed a problem, they get handed a solution, and it's their job to figure out the how. It's their job to figure out you know, what that process should be and what the milestone should be and what the cadence should be and how the team should be organized. And then gradually, the, the product manager gets more senior, they get handed a problem and they come back with the solution. They figure out the creative ways to solve a problem. And then finally, you hand this PM a space and they come back with the problems themselves. And they say, I know you sent me in to talk about, um, to think about activation, but I've decided that our biggest problem is retention, or I've, I've decided that our biggest problem is our brand, or maybe our problem has something to do with the team or has something to do with the positioning or something completely different that you may not have thought of. And so this is another way to think about how, how uh, product managers move through their careers. We then do this exercise where each of these eight product leads took our uh, teams and we slotted them using these two axes. And what we found was that people naturally laid on this black curve that uh, early on in people's careers, the, the direction of movement was mostly you're, you're uh, focused on execution and just doing it on bigger and bigger things. Later in people's careers, we saw the same thing. The people were uh, mostly at this sort of P level, the peak of what we what, uh, thought here. And they were just growing the problems that they were working on, growing the products, growing the product lines. But most of what we had to do when working on promotions and so on was this middle of the, of the bucket. And I like to call this the trough of disillusionment. Uh, one of the uh, speeches we used to give to our group of people doing calibrations for product managers is that in, in where most PMs lived at Google, the difference in the job they did was often subtle. And so we would talk about in order to decide whether someone should be promoted from let's say level three was here and level seven was here. The difference was rarely the job. The difference was how they did the job. And that was a very different way to think about promotions and, and uh, capabilities of product managers. I call it the trough of disillusionment because for the individual, this was so different than what they're used to. We've gone through our whole lives, our whole careers. You know, in school, you kind of move forward grade by grade, you get through different classes, you get different certifications and so on. And so we're just taught that this is, this axis matters. And so uh, seeing it switch and seeing that jobs aren't necessarily getting bigger, but the way you're expected to do the job is changing is one of the key characteristics of, of, of growth and product. So I found this to be very sticky for thinking about product managers. I'll, I'll just mention briefly that this was invented for product managers, but I've actually found that it works just as well for many other disciplines. I use the same framework for engineers. I use the same framework for designers, for salespeople, for marketers. Um, and if we like, we can come back and talk more about that as well. But this was sort of topic number one, was really how to judge what great is. Okay, so let's move on to topic number two. So topic number two, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cadence and how you run your team. And, and the key thing to know about this, and the, the line I'd like everybody to remember is design your rhythm like you design your app. And we're gonna talk about not what makes a great PM, but how you execute as a, as a great product leader. The concept I'll use is one from a book called Game Storming. This is one of my favorite books. Um, and if you haven't read it, please grab a copy. The, it starts with this analogy of these two kids playing ball. And the analogy is that kids are throwing the ball back and forth. And at some point, one of the kids says, how about we keep score? And we're gonna watch how many times we can do this without dropping the ball. And the other kid says, I have an idea. How about I take a step back every time and we'll see how long we can go. And that seems like lots of fun. The, the authors of this book recognize this as a, as a pivotal moment that what these kids were doing changed from play to game. And the same thing happens in the workplace. And they were describing this in terms of meetings. So we've all been to a meeting that feels like play. We're not really sure what's happening. There's no agenda. It's not really clear who the decision maker is. All these different parts of the process are all over the place. And then we go to ones that really feel organized. What's the difference? Right? And their observation was games have some characteristics. They have rules. They have uh, boundaries. They have uh, conditions. They have materials. You can't do a post-it brainstorm without a post-it. Uh, and you can't play ball without a ball. Uh, they have time limits. There's lots of different things that lead from the difference between play and games. So if you think about this from the perspective of being a product leader, you probably use philosophy like that in designing your products all the time. You think about the incentives, you think about the behaviors you want your users to take. And my encouragement here is do the same thing as you design your own rhythm. 
Uh, in this document, which by the way, I think uh, Sid and team, feel free to put it in the chat, the link to the document so people can run through uh, the examples on their own. Um, there's a list of examples here. I'm just gonna talk through this first one, uh, but we can we can talk about some of the others uh, separately or maybe in the, in the questions. So uh, I'm gonna talk about this one, um, which is from a doc that uh, uh, describes how we run distributed teams. And just as uh, a little bit of background, I've run a, I've run distributed teams of various su source for well over a decade. Coda is a very distributed team. And so we've ended up innovating in a number of different areas here. The, the, this doc divides into five different parts. I'm only gonna focus on the meetings part here. And I'm gonna talk about what we do with meetings and in particular, the same principle, design your meetings like you design your apps. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about two very specific things we do that hopefully both illustrate the point and give you maybe some actionable suggestions. So in Coda meetings, we tend to use something called a Dory. And Dory is a name that uh, was invented uh, or was used a lot at Google uh, as a name for a ranked Q&A tool that we used for our Friday TGIFs, where Larry and Sergey would answer questions from the whole company. Uh, it's named after the fish from Finding Nemo who asks all the questions. So the way this works is pretty simple. Uh, anybody can come in, they can add a question, and they can say, should we launch? And they, uh, everyone else will go and upvote and downvote these questions, and we go through them in ranked order. The interesting thing about this process is the behavioral changes it causes in the company are really interesting. It's a much more efficient process, but it does a few things. First, it equalizes the audience. And it means that I'm sure you've all been in meetings where whoever is the highest paid person or the loudest voice ends up dominating the meeting. But all of a sudden, this allows anybody to have the same voice. And my questions go right in line with everybody else's. Second, it ranks your discussion. You leave the room and you say, we didn't get through every question, but we got through every, uh, got through everything with at least three upvotes. And it's very satisfying and leads to a much better sense of, uh, of how you're running your meetings. And then finally, it turns out that you get much better form questions. The second example I wanna give, so this is what first thing we do is called Dory. Second example I wanna give is called Pulse Check. And the way this works is we're in a meeting and we're ready to discuss and align on a specific topic. Should we launch this product? Should we buy this company? Um, and the way it works is uh, everybody comes in, they add their pulse check and say, uh, we should absolutely launch. The metrics are amazing. Um, and then you check this box and now you can see everybody else's. So in addition to being significantly more efficient, what's the main thing we get out of this? We avoid groupthink. I'm sure you've all been in a meeting where somebody says, should we do X? And you go around the room and the first person says yes, and the second person says yes, and the third person says yes. And at that point, the fourth person kind of has no choice but to say yes. And this removes that element of how, of how we work. So just taking a step back from this example, Dory and Pulse are two things that, that we do. Um, back in, uh, in uh, this document, you'll see you'll see a number of different cases uh, and examples that we've seen people build and how Square makes decisions with a process called Spade and uh, Claire, the Stripe CEO, has a very unique way for running offsites or Yuki Yamashita at Figma designed a different way to think about the launch cow meeting or or Wade runs a very distributed team at, at Zapier and, and Jenny built a new model for one-on-ones at Square. Th these, are, these are all different examples, but they all follow a very simple core principle, design your rhythm like you design your app. Okay, so that's uh, topic number two. Uh, and now I'll jump ahead uh, to the last topic and we'll talk about personal cadence. So uh, my main message here is how to intentionally take control of your time. And I'm gonna start with an example from uh, one of my favorite product leaders, a guy named Des Trainer. Uh, Des is the co-founder of a company called Intercom. Uh, if people haven't used Intercom, very popular product. Uh, and it's a, a CRM product that does very, very well. But this actually has very little to do with Intercom. Uh, Des is also a prolific writer and he tweets a lot. And so this was one of his tweets that I really liked and said, your email is what others think you should work on. Your to-do list is what you think you should work on. And your calendar is usually what you actually work on. How much do they overlap in your world? And he had these old Venn diagrams that described it. Very insightful tweet. Uh, you know, over 1400 people liked it. Over 400 people retweeted it. And you know, the main thing I was thinking about as I looked at this tweet is back to this message, how to int intentionally take control of your time. You know, we know that as product leaders, what we do sets an upper bound on the on the uh, on the business. If we're organized and on top of things and know where we should be spending time, then it probably the the rest of the team can rise to that. But if we're not, it's very hard for the rest of the team to rise to that. In this particular case, he actually turned it into an actionable 
uh, suggestion. And so here I'll show you. Um, this is uh, the doc you published. You can search for it, or you can find it in the Coda Gallery. Um, and it just walks through how to actually do this process. And in this case, what he did is um, publish a doc with three steps of pre-work. You set up your to-do list. Uh, you then sync in your email. He uses a feature of Coda called PAC. So he, in this case, he syncs in his starred Gmail messages. And then he syncs in his calendar. And so you have uh, a row for every item in your calendar. So those are three steps of pre-work. You have your to-do list, your email, and your calendar in one place. And then he runs the system where every day or every week, I think in his case, he takes everything in his inbox uh, and he either adds it to his to-do list or he links it to something already on his to-do list. Then he goes and rearranges his calendar to match. He takes everything on his to-do list and he makes sure it has a spot on his calendar. Then he runs his week. And throughout his week, his to-do list now just has two new columns. When am I supposed to work on this? And where did it came, come from? And at the end of the week, he gets a little chart. And this chart shows what portion of time was spent on things that had linked to-dos and didn't. And it gives a little stat for this. I like this example for a couple different reasons. Number one, I run my life on this. I've been doing it for over a year now. Uh, this number is is kind of like my barometer of success in a week. And I'll say this week, this number was at about 45% for me. Um, any week where I cross 50% is a really good week for me. 50% of my time being spent on things that were on my to-do list at the beginning of the week. And initially that was shocking to me. How could I be that irresponsible that half my time is spent on things that weren't on my list? And I've gradually come to understand that my responsibilities are often beyond that. Um, but this is really interesting and impactful uh, as, a, as a specific example. But actually, the, the message I want to leave with is not the specific example. It's the idea that you should intentionally take control of your time. I'm sure many of you have been on Twitter or uh, on uh, different blogs and so on. You've read something like this. You've hit like. You've hit retweet. You've filed it away in the back of your head. And you said, that's a really interesting idea, and then done nothing about it. What Des did here was he took his tweet, and I like to say he compiled it into software. And he turned it into a workable system that actually changes his behavior and makes his work uh, better. And I would encourage that as you think of these ideas, really implement them and intentionally take control of your time. So those are three topics I wanted to share. Um, I think that the idea of forming a great team and understanding what, what great in a role is requires coming up with a, a clear rubric. I found this push as a great way to do it, problem, solution, how, execution. Uh, secondly, uh, many of you are in roles where you're responsible for how your team operates. Put as much thought into thinking about that rhythm as you put into thinking about the things you're actually designing. And then finally, remember that how you execute sets a high watermark for how the entire team executes. So intentionally take control of your time, take your methods, and turn them into actionable frameworks so that you can really use them. And I'll just pause there and uh, uh, hand it back for, for questions. OK. All right. Thank you so much, Ashir, for that. Uh, we have uh, people asking for that Kona document over there. Um, there's a ton of amazing automations and stuff that you can set up or just copy directly into your own Kodas. Um, so put the link. I think the link is in the chat. But if it's not, just we're going to drop it there. Uh, and of course, everyone gets the recording as well. So you'll have access to that, and you'll, you'll be able to see how to use that. Uh, if you have any questions, drop in the Q&A. We have about uh, seven minutes for questions here. Uh, and we have a few coming in. So our number one question from Sai is, uh, thanks for the tips and calendar grooming. I love that too, personally. Uh, how do you take control when often you have other stakeholders or coworkers booking meetings into your calendar? Oh, what a great question. Um, I, I have tons of, uh, tons of ideas on this topic, but I have one very simple principle, which is uh, deal with meeting requests, not meetings. Um, I, I have, happen to have an executive assistant. Not everybody does. It's OK. Um, and this is a, a system that me and Monica, my EA, have worked out. We've been working together for uh, a decade now. And the core, our breakthrough moment on this was when we realized that the thing you want to be ranking is meeting requests, not meetings. And it's a very common thing. You'll open up your calendar. You'll look at your uh, calendar and say, oh, that I really wish I hadn't agreed to that. I really wish this thing wasn't, um, I wasn't going to spend time on it. And uh, Monica and I would sit together and we try to like reverse engineer how to fix this problem. 
And then we changed the model and they said, okay, anybody who wants to meet me, they put the, they get, send me their meeting request. We have a code doc that does this, goes to our email, ends up in a queue, and then we rank it there. And I say, this is high priority, medium priority, low priority. This needs to be in person. This needs to be uh, on video conference. Of course, everything needs to be on video conference now. Um, and this is 30 minutes, this is an hour. This is something I wanna do in the next uh, week. This is something I wanna do in the next month. And I find that that, that technique is very helpful. The second thing I would say, so meeting requests, not meetings, number one. The second thing I would say, take control of your time. That document I shared with Des, one of the things it'll lead you to do is it'll take all the things you're trying to get done and you block time for them. And the what happens is if your calendar is full of things that are already on your list, then people, if, even if they have access to your calendar and they skip your admin and they and they go, they go past all that and they end up on your calendar anyway, they won't overbook something that you already have uh, blocked. Um, so put those things in place. If you follow that process, you'll find that start your week. A lot of people talk about big rocks philosophy, fill the big rocks first. Same basic idea with your calendar. Fill it with the things that you're supposed to get done and then people will work around it for everything else. So those are two suggestions for that. That's a great one. And, and I often also just like block off time in mind for just like no meeting time as well. Um, yes. and I'd love to use that Quora document now, now that I've seen how it works. Um, our next question from Max is, when you come when you come into an established team, how do you go about facilitating cultural change? Yeah, you know, I think it's a great, great question. And I and I think some of it starts with understanding what you want that change to be and the what are your values. I mean, this the the, the thing I started with with PSHE was originally designed as a way to think about uh, uh, individual growth and promotions and so on, but really it's a value system. It says that th this is what we what we value is we value uh, asking the right question. We value coming up with the creative solutions to problems, and we value that in in the teams I've worked on. We actually value that over execution. Execution is great, but the person who does a great job executing but isn't good at asking the right question and focusing on the right things, it, for me, doesn't end up working very well. And I'll I'll mention there are companies for which. The, the opposite dynamics in place where execution uh, execution trump strategy and 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 there are, are roles where that's uh, and companies where that, the value swaps so I think a lot of it starts with defining those those values and then you work them into all of your behaviors and so to take e easy example I showed this this example with Dorian pulse these things that we do in, in our meetings and and the you know one of the reasons we do that one of the reasons that the, the dory is there is it helps us make sure we're asking the right questions and and that's that's one you know we, we originally designed that because we're a fairly distributed team but now if you get a group of code employees even if there's only three or four of them and even if we're in the same room together we will almost always use a dory and a pulse check and the reason for it is very simple that answering the right question is is super important to any discussion and before you figure out do you have the right answer do you do you even have the right question so i think as you as you make that list of values uh we have three th three primary values at coda uh, that we can talk more about if you like, but the you take each of them and then you codify them into your process, so they're reinforced over and over and over again. And that's, I think, one of the key parts of, of building that culture in. Nice. All right. So, so decide on those values first, and then codify them, and then start working towards that. Um, yeah. Vivek asks, how do you build a culture of high ownership? You know, I think this is an interesting problem and challenge. I think the 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 best analogy that I've heard for this is something called building cathedrals. And there's an old fable about this, that this, this uh, person walks up to these three workers at this construction site and he asks them what their, what their jobs are. And the first person says, my job is to take brick and I take it from this pile of bricks and I move it over here. Um, and the second person goes, second person says, what's your job? He says, well, my job is the mortar. I take this, I take the mortar and I put it on the brick and then I stack them up and that's my job. And it goes to the third person says, what's your job? And the third person says, I'm building a cathedral. Um, and it was very clear, like the frame of reference is very different between between these these three people. And what one question I would ask when we say high ownership starts from what did you give them ownership of? And, you know, I'll, 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 I'll use an example. When I was uh, working at YouTube, I did this exercise and we did it live. So I asked, I randomly called on it. We were having this leadership conference. I gave this speech about cathedrals and then I randomly called on someone and said what's your job this person says oh I run related videos for YouTube I said great what's related videos for YouTube he says well we take uh, you're watching a video and we take all the candidate videos that you might want to watch next and we take them and we put them on the on the right side of the page and sometimes below the page 
And I said, boy, that sounds an awful lot. Like I take the bricks from over here and I move them over here, right? So what do you, what's the cathedral? What are you really building as you're, as you're building this thing? And it took a while to get back through this. It's, well, I help people discover what to watch next. I help people uh, extend one opportunity with another. And he started thinking about it more and more broadly. And all of a sudden the cathedral emerged. So the, probably the biggest thing I can say about building a culture of high ownership, go through your list of uh, teams, think about how they've defined themselves and judge. Does it sound like I'm responsible for bricks or does it feel like I'm responsible for cathedrals? And that's, I think the, the biggest thing I'd say about it. Awesome. Yeah, this is a really good exercise to run with your teams. Uh, and of course, this whole thing is being recorded. So you could even just send a recording to your teams uh, so that they get the, the parable of the cathedral. Uh, we have less than a minute to go. So unfortunately, I don't think we could take on any more questions now. But like I said, you will get the recordings. And you can ask uh, Shashir some questions online. So Shashir, where can people find you? Yeah, I, I, I think we'll be hanging out at, I think, one of the rooms later. So so uh, myself and some of the other Coda folks will be there. The doc that I shared is available uh, to everyone. I'm super easy to find. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, so on. I'm not that many Shashir Marotras out there, so you'll find me quickly. Feel free to reach out with any questions. I always learn from people's questions, and uh, I look forward to hearing what, what people have in mind. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Shashir. Have a great day. Thanks, Sid.